Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for asking us to come and present here. Um, I'm Felicity Snowsill, and this is my colleague, Lindsay. We work for NHS Tayside. And we've been asked to do a presentation around what young people ask on the Call to Talk website. Um, and we decided really to, to do the presentation on what they ask and what do they really mean. Um, I'd like to, already I've learned something, which is great, which is why you come to these things. So that whole thing about working in silos and the move towards a more holistic approach um, is something we're finding more and more, and that's a really good thing. Um, even at a strategic level, we still hear people saying, well, let's put the funding in this bundle with sexual health and risk-taking behaviour. But sex is meant to be fun, isn't it? Aren't we meant to be portraying it in a very positive way? And so even at a strategic level, in, I work for the sexual health and BBV team, um, we haven't quite got that holistic uh, view there. And the other thing, it's the person, not the topic. You know, we talk about things, we talk about drugs and alcohol or sexual health, but actually what we're dealing with as a person. And I think the ACE study is really, really interesting and will influence everything that we do. We get asked lots of stuff. Last year, we helped someone deliver a baby. Um, it wasn't our first baby, but it was our first birth. We had three posts of a woman, or a young woman, a very young woman, who was about to give birth and, didn't, and just needed some support. Um, of course, we told her to call an ambulance, but she did come back and she said, thank you very much for being there. Um, in some ways, that's one of the more straightforward things we've had to deal with. Digital interventions, something that came up. Where do young people get their information? Um, why, do we use, why should we use di digital interventions and what's the evidence? Um, interactive di digital... <laughs> start again. Interactive digital interventions, out of all of them, few address the issues that are actually important to young people, such as sexual pleasure in relationships. Um, young people are looking for personalised advice. Um, we're very good at telling young people or talking to young people about what they shouldn't do and how to avoid uh, disease or pregnancy. Um, Online services are demand-led and where young people are in control and they're agents of their own change. Digital platforms are quick, convenient and relatively cheap methods for conducting research and they can target a population. And in the digital world, it can be, not always obviously, a safe space. And, you know, every day is a school day, and, but some things become really clear is that young people need safe spaces to get their questions answered. They always have, and they need reassurance and advice about the things that are important to them. They need anonymity, respect, and trust, and ease of access to do that. These safe spaces might be a place, that's a service, a school, or a youth club, a person, or somewhere online. And more than ever, it's not something they do, but somewhere that they go. It's unthinkable for most young people to not be connected in some way, and so it makes sense to use those networks and the roots and the language and the media that young people are already using. They are confident and constant users of digital technology. They commonly multitask online, um, but this also means there are competing, <laughs> sorry, competing demands on their attention. Um, before I launch into Call to Talk, this is very timely actually, we have actually um, undertaken a piece of insight gathering that was commissioned to Task Scotland, but for us at NHS Tayside. Um, and again, this is really just saying, you know, what, what are young people asking? What do they want to know? And what we did was we um, had a consultation online with over a thousand young people across Tayside. And we asked in small group discussions, young people, we ask them, what do you need to make a relationship good? What are the, some of the things that get in the way of the kind of relationship you want? And what do you expect from sex? What do you think other people expect from sex? And from these discussions, a number of themes emerged that became online pages that asked young people to tell us more about their experiences when it came to alcohol, 
body image, confidence, communication, condoms, contraception, distance, drugs, family, friends, happiness, honesty, jealousy, love, respect, one night stands, pleasure, porn, pressure, safe sex, social media, stress, and trust. It's all in there. <laughs> um, one of the uses that we hope to make of the Make It Good is to inform so, you know, future work and, and taking a social marketing approach. Um, but we've got lots and lots of useful insight from that. And again, it kind of reiterates that whole thing that it isn't about the topic. You know, there's, there's very little point in some ways of targeting young people and talking about drugs and alcohol or safe sex because it's just part of their life and the much bigger picture. Um, rather than viewing young people's relationships and sexual behaviour as problematic, we've framed Make It Good in an open, positive a non-judgmental way, seeking to engage young people in a conversation for what makes a relationship that may or may not be sexual good. This is what they came up with. So, you know, one of the topics was drugs and alcohol, and I, I'm going to just look very quickly at that um, particular part of the Make It Good research. Very little, and you'll see that when we talk about cool to talk, we get very few questions about drugs and alcohol because on the scale of things, they're not actually a big part of young people's lives, but they're integrated into the fabric. Um, but many of the issues that were raised highlight the wider vulnerabilities of young people. For young people, alcohol is strongly associated with having fun and feelings of freedom and confidence. Young people's insight pays attention to the downside of alcohol in the context of relationship they identify regret and coercion as powerful considerations. They highlight a lack of self-efficacy, vulnerabilities, poor understanding of consent in their emerging understanding and experiences of personal relationships. Their views on drugs are mixed, linked to enjoyment and partying with friends rather than being considered in terms of intimate relationships. Drug use is seen as undermining trust, making a partner less reliable. Um, so that's the Make It Good research, and I just wanted to use that because I think it's very timely and it puts what we do on Cool to Talk in, in context, really. Cool to Talk is a safe space to ask questions. I've been going for about 10 years now, and, and in those days, actually, when we look back, it was very pioneering. Um, it's undergone a few facelifts, but it's really simple. It's like a tin of beans. It does what it says on the can. We answer young people's questions, and that's really all we do. Um, cool to Talk's interactive. Young people, we work in the Western Isles as well as Tayside. They can get their questions answered honestly and correctly, and we offer young people reassurance, encouragement, information advice on any health-related issue as well as signposting to appropriate services. It offers a first step to get help in situations where many young people may fall through the net because they're too worried or too scared to talk to someone. And it's promoted to let young people know they can ask questions about anything. It is also completely anonymous. We have, um, we have a child protection policy, and obviously we can sometimes track young people through their IP, internet service providers, um, and, but that's also a very difficult thing to do. But we have, on one or two occasions in the last 10 years, had to contact um, CEOP or the police. It's not a chat room or an email service. Um, questions and answers are posted onto the site so that everybody can read them, and we answer everything within 24 hours. It's a really important link to other appropriate and accessible services for young people. Um, and we can signpost, obviously, to the local services, and we have a really good directory, but we also have really good relationships with the services across Tayside. Young people are asked for basic information um, just for monitoring and evaluation. We've developed, uh, just very quickly, we've developed an online counselling service on One to One, on Cool to Talk called One to One, and twice a week we offer two sessions, four sessions altogether, um, of online chat. We don't really call it counselling because it's a, a waiting room system, but young people can come on and they can chat to a, um, a professional counsellor 
uh, for 50 minutes at a time. And there's been a really good uptake in that service. And again, the, the topics covered really look, go right across the spectrum of vulnerabilities for young people. Um, and again, the, the online therapy or, or doing something online, evidence shows that young people have more choice about how they engage. It has a level of anonymity that transcends class, gender and race and it makes a neutral environment. So there's lots of really good things about having uh, digital interventions. I'm going to hand over to Lindsay now. Thank you. Okay, so we were asked um, really to come along and talk about some of the things that young people are asking and what is it that they actually want to know when they come onto the website. So obviously, first of all, what we do is Cool to Talk yeah. represents young people's voices. Um, over 25,000 young people have posted questions over the site, on the site over the last five years. Um, and not only does that kind of offer them a space to come and talk about things, but it also gives us an idea of some of the trends locally that are happening. So we can share that with other professionals. So Felicity talked about the networks that we have in place. Um, for lots of young people, it's just really a place to get some reassurance um, to find out that what they're going through is normal. Um, if it isn't, how we can support them around that. Um, and what we get is, um, in terms of site traffic, we get a lot of young people coming on asking questions, but we also get a lot of young people who just come on and look at what other young people have been asking. So they might not always want to come and ask a question directly. So in a way, it's a bit of a forum for them to come along and check out, you know, what are other young people wanting to know? Is it the same as what I would like to know? Um, and it reinforces really that a lot of young people are worried about the same things. Um, over the last few years, we've got a little bit smarter about how we integrate the site into other services. So we have things like um, a Facebook syphilis campaign that we then link into the Cool to Talk website. Um, things like the consultation around the teen pregnancy and young people strategy. Um, and also at the moment, we've got a, a, a questionnaire around pornography in young people, which we've got running on the site, which has received kind of 180 responses so far. So quite a, a, a clever way, I think, of engaging with young people and where they're at. So this is just a breakdown then of um, some of the things that were being asked and how many sort of people we get on the site. So I'm not going to read that out to you. I know that you can kind of look at that um, yourself. But quite interestingly, the split between boys and girls remains at kind of three to one. We do get more girls coming on the site and asking questions. But we do find that um, in terms of gender who are coming on and accessing the site to maybe look at the other questions that other young people are asking, we have a lot of males, it's a kind of more even split in terms of them coming on and actually accessing. Um, and you can see there that the highest usage we have is in the 14 to 16 year age bracket. In terms of topics, this is the breakdown. So when we put reports together or we come and speak at things like this, this is the information that we would feed back to people. So each question that comes on, we would put it under a topic heading when we file it away. But what we find is that it can be sometimes very difficult to find a topic heading or that one or two might apply. So we generally put it on on the one that fits best, but we might put another couple, might put it under another few subheadings as well. So um, you can see there that we get you know, asked lots and lots of different things um, around some of the things that you're covering today, sexual health, emotional health, drugs and alcohol. Um, we reach young people from all of the SIMD areas across um, Tayside and the, the Western Isles, but Dundee in particular, we have the highest questions from SI, SIMD 1, which is the kind of area of, of most uh, deprivation across Dundee. So we know that we're targeting vulnerable people, uh, vulnerable young people, and the way that we would do that is we would go in and we would kind of try and promote it quite cleverly within young people's units and within some of the areas across the across the city. So that's the topics, but we kind of thought that that didn't really give you a clear idea of what young people are actually asking. So what is it that's really important to them? So what we thought we would do is we would break it down into themes. So in terms of things like feelings, worries, concerns, these are the kind of themes that we thought saw emerging through some of the questions. So isolation, loneliness, feeling a little bit different, Lots of things around feelings, anger, sadness, depression, and how young people deal with those feelings. What's their outlet for them? Have they been taught any coping mechanisms in terms of how you deal with some of those strong feelings? So we thought really that the themes told us a little bit more about the vulnerability of the young people who are using the site than the actual topics do. 
So for example, in the previous slide, the drugs and alcohol part seems quite small. But what we're finding is that that might run through a lot of the themes of some of the other stuff that, that they're asking and some of the other questions. So it highlights that some of the things they're asking are often complex, quite confusing situations that young people can find themselves in. And the kind of, kind of multifaceted nature of the vulnerability of the young people that we're supporting. So as Felicity said earlier, it's a person that we're working with. It's not, it's not just a question. Um, but I think what we also have to remember is that young people who are using the site are really empowered and confident enough to come on and ask us. And I think that kind of speaks volumes about the fact that they're not kind of just, you know, stand on parts in their own lives. You know, they are quite proactive in seeking help and finding help. So we've pulled up a couple of questions for you just to kind of show you some of the things we're, they're asking. Again, we've highlighted some of the things that we think are um, the kind of, you know, the most sort of prominent, the most concerning, lots of things around feelings, um, and I'll kind of let you read that, I'm not going to read it out, but the things that jumped out from this one was that this person didn't have anyone else to talk to, freaking out, absolutely freeze, couldn't move, so a young person who's been in a situation where they felt completely powerless, completely vulnerable, and didn't know who else to speak to. So some of the things that we kind of see coming out of that are things like isolation and fear, she doesn't know who to talk to. It's her friend's boyfriend. What's going to happen if that situation comes out? Who's going to get the blame for that? Also, impact for the future. So if anything did come out, who's going to get the blame? And I think as well that the dual vulnerability of it as well. So obviously it's a young girl who's come on and asked this question. So she doesn't maybe know how to deal with the situation. Is it a confidence issue? Is it expectations around how boys behave, around how girls behave? Um, but also there's a young male here who's put himself in danger. So his behaviour is inappropriate. You know, what could happen to him if that ever gets out? Maybe if she dealt with it differently, if she'd reported it to somebody. So we've got two young people here who are kind of at risk of, of harm. Um, we're also finding an extra dimension in a lot of other questions around this kind of behaviour with um, mobile phones, social media. So a lot of young people who are maybe being filmed without their consent or being filmed with their consent and then the images or the footage is then being shared with other people. Um, and obviously the repercussions of that for young people and how that feels and how that impacts on, on their day-to-day -day life, going to school, seeing their friends, yeah. Maybe mum might find out, all those kind of things. Um, the next one we've got, again, some of the themes around helplessness, being scared of getting found out, um, want to show their parents that they don't own them. And I think, you know, what this highlights is the kind of pressure for young people around fitting in. Um, and peer pressure, when we talk about peer pressure, we often think about it from coming from outside, from being an external pressure, but really a lot of the pressure that young people feel comes from inside. And it's not really about the reality of what their friends are doing. A lot of the time it's about a perception of what other young people are doing or how they're behaving. A lot of conflict there. So sometimes, you know, we just assume that growing up, conflict with authority, it's a rite of passage for young people. And we just kind of assume that it's something they'll go through and they'll come out the other end, no problem. But actually it causes a lot of conflict for them. So you can see that this, this young person is, you know, stuck in that, that kind of way of wanting to do what they want to do, not wanting to get in trouble, but also wanting to kind of kick back against authority and parents and things like that. And also that kind of mention there of self-harm just tapped on the end. We're getting a huge increase at the moment of um, young people who are using self-harm as coping mechanisms. It's quite interesting talking about the ACE stuff, about, you know, coping strategies rather than self-harm or something that's seen as dangerous or harmful, how do we you know, work with the young person to find something that, that's better for their health? Lots of wider pressure as well. And in, child, in the Childline report last year, we know that there's been a 20% increase in their counselling sessions of the amount of young people who are accessing support around self-harm. This one here, we've got lots of regret around choices, um, guilt, responsibility. Um, this young female has um, felt that she's made choices that were maybe taken out with her control. She didn't have much to do with it. Um, 
we talked about alcohol. We know that in the salsa study said that 52% of alcohol, it's more likely to be drunk at a party or at someone else's house. So 44% of young people are drinking alcohol at somebody else's house. So what that does is it removes it from any boundaries. It takes it away. It makes it more private, less chance of having those conversations within the family. And we can see that this young girl has been quite vulnerable within a relationship. But if she's engaging in behaviour that she sees as risky or she might get in trouble for, she's maybe not going to come home and talk to mum about that. Done some research locally in the Angus area with Women's Aid last year and we found that 20% of young people are experiencing emotional abuse in their own intimate partner relationships. And that was young people under the age of 18. Um, but who do they talk to? And what's going to happen if they do? Um, talk about losing her virginity. Was it consensual? Um, we talk about the role of alcohol in sexual behaviour, but it's not always that clear cut. You know, just drinking alcohol doesn't always lead to risky sexual behaviour. There's other things going on there too. But also the flip side of this is some of the issues that we think young people are having around sexual behaviour and pleasure. So, you know, as Felicity said earlier, sex should be fun. It should be consensual. It should be enjoyable. But maybe for this young person, without those messages, now that the relationship's gone wrong, She's maybe feeling that that was something that she shouldn't done, shouldn't have done. And the very last one, we just kind of put this up here because, again, it highlights the additional external pressures on young people around sexual behaviour. So we've got here a young person who's a virgin, but who's asking some pretty in-depth questions about sexual behaviour. Um, and some of it is completely, you know, appropriate, and she wants to know about how sex works and what happens. But you can see there as well that some of the things that she's asking, she's very clearly had messages from elsewhere about what it means to be sexual as a young person. Um, we have a lot of questions on the website about young people who ask about shaving pubic hair. Do you have to do it? Is it compulsory? What will happen if you don't? Young people who are in a lot of pain because they maybe have ingrown hair or it's very uncomfortable but they still don't want to stop shaving. So a very kind of clear idea um, about the kind of norm in our culture. Um, and the importance of your kind of public image or what other people think about you in contrast to your own sort of personal comfort and your own sort of wants, desires. Um, and also you can see there she's asking about quite specific sexual acts as well. So where has she heard that language? Does she know what they mean? Um, and also, you know, she's maybe more worried about her performance sexually and how to please the guy than she is about it being a good experience for her. So we've got a real kind of... Um, you know, a, a real kind of chasm there between sort of pleasure for you and how you think it should be for other people. Um, and it also indicates a real lack of confidence about communicating with a sexual partner. You should be able to ask your partner these things instead of coming to us. And a wee bit there about risk and protective factors. So we've already heard about ACEs and things today. So um, we know that, you know, Young people have lots of things going on for them that actually can cause them problems or can really help with their problems. And in terms of the, the Polish and the Diamonds report, the Scottish Public Health Network, which came out in May 2006, it talks about developing resilience to transform toxic stress into tolerable stress. Um, and that children who end up dealing well with adversity usually have somebody there, at least one stable, committed relationship with a supported parent or another adult. And a lot of the stuff that we do on Cool to Talk is to try and facilitate those relationships and try and encourage young people to find out who is that adult, who can you build that relationship with. And sometimes it's just about communication skills in your own home or in your own sort of family environment so that there's somebody there who can support you. <laughs> Nearly finished. Um, and I think just to reiterate again, you know, the cross, the, the real underlying theme for all the Make It Good research was communication. Young people want to know more about, or how, you know, how are they learning to communicate? Are we teaching them to communicate? Communication, trust and intimacy, these were the kind of key things. And, and they underline the choices that young people make. Um, and, and again, coming back to that whole thing is that it's a safe space, and that's what we need to do. We need to provide those safe spaces for young people. And ever since I've been working on the website for nine or ten years now, and, and it's really good. Young people are coming to us before they have sex. Isn't it great that that young person actually came to us first so that we can reflect back and we can say, 
well, you need to think about these things and have you thought about this so that they've got a safe space in their head to do that. Um, really just to say is that that's what we do. You know, the response that we provide is really about reflecting, listening to feelings. We, we all use a counselling response. We've really developed our practice in, over the years and the site has developed and we've um, become much more savvy about how we respond and, and, and the sort of, uh, I suppose, the skills that we have as well. We've learnt as we, we go along. Um, we try and build confidence. We provide reassurance on what is normal and what isn't. It's very much a stepping stone, so we work very, very closely with partners, so partnership work, networking, all of those things. Um, we work closely with child protection, but also it's a fantastic resource for professionals as well as young people. Young people can go on there, as Lindsay said, and realise that they're not alone. They can have a measure of what is normal to ask and what are the kind of things that young people are asking. And it has to be said the questions come up again and again and again. Very little shocks us. You know, we're not seeing things that are particularly unusual in terms of what young people are asking. They're asking the same things. Maybe there are different trends, but they're asking fundamentally the same things that they were asking 10 years ago. It's back to that safe space. Um, so it's a fantastic resource for professionals as well, because if you don't know how to answer a young person's question, you can look on the website and it will give you some tips and, 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 and you can see the responses. We do get responses. We try and get feedback. Um, we have a feedback section where young people come on the site and they can feed back. We go into schools and we do evaluations. We often get young people more and more actually as we've changed the way we practice. Um, we get young people coming back and saying, thank you, my baby was born safely. Um, or thanks for doing this, uh, you know, you really helped me. But these are a couple of questions. And in the way that Lindsay pulled out um, some of the words, I think the feedback questions are also very telling in what we should be looking for when we support young people. It's made me feel so much better knowing that someone is out there that would listen to my problem and try and help, helped me in itself. And I think, again, these are the things that we need to provide for young people. Um, and again here, uh, the things that we need to pull out of this, asking how to cope. Um, it made her feel great to have people to rely on when times get too tough. And again, it just underlines the fact that we need to provide that safe space. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.